Fighting for fairness and fertility. You're watching a Five News Tonight special. I want my own child that I can put down at night and I haven't got to give them back, you know, and we can just, we can just love it. We'll be hearing the heartbreaking stories from those losing out on the postcode lottery of IVF. Plus the physical and emotional toll that struggles with fertility can cause. And we'll be investigating the new routes to parenthood that some people are taking. I'll be speaking to our live studio audience and hearing your stories too. This is Fertility Fighting for Family, a Five News Tonight special. Good evening, I'm Claudia Eliza Armand, and welcome to this special programme dedicated to the issues surrounding fertility. Now, the desire for children is such a strong human instinct, but for many it can turn into a long and painful fight. Around one in seven couples, that's three and a half million people, have trouble conceiving naturally for so many reasons, and the emotional, physical and financial strain can be immense. Well, we've got an exclusive survey that reveals the despair couples feel and the comments from people that can make it so much worse. And we've got a live studio audience made up of people with their own experiences as well as leading experts in the field. Good evening to you all. But first, um, when it comes to unfairness, one of the biggest examples is IVF. In England, guidelines from the advisory body NICE say that, under, that women under 40 should be offered three full cycles on the NHS, but so often that isn't the case. Our chief correspondent, Tessa Chapman, looks at the reality of IVF and the reasons why so many are refused it. The clock's ticking and your time is slowly running out. It's been five long, painful years since Emma Eady started trying for a baby with her husband, Lee. They've always adored children and dote on nieces and nephews, but nothing stops the heartache of infertility. I want my own child that I can put down at night and I haven't got to give them back, you know, and we can just, we can just love her and just help them, teach them to ride their bike, teach them when they fall over. You know, you're going to get hurt and stuff like that, put things on their knees and just bake cakes, just do normal things that normal people do. We just want something that we can call ours. Emma and Lee have been told IVF could help them, but they're at the mercy of a postcode lottery. There are 195 clinical commissioning groups, or CCGs, in England, which decide how to spend NHS money. New research has found only 26 of them offer the full three cycles, as recommended in NICE guidelines. Most offer one or two rounds. Seven, including Emma and Lee's CCG in North East Essex, don't routinely offer any. This is the response from campaigners. The screams of childbirth are loud. The screams of infertility are just as important. They're shouting not just about general cuts, but extra criteria being used to ration access to women like Della, who jumped one hurdle to be met with another. To start with, it was a case of weight, to lose weight, um, to have a healthier lifestyle. And when we finally sort of reached the goals that we were set, we was told that we was entitled to any funded IVF because uh, my partner had a child from a previous relationship. In fact, nine out of 10 CCGs now don't offer IVF if either partner has had a child however long ago. Our own survey found other couples were refused treatment because the man was told he was overweight or too old, or in one case because he was an official UK resident but not British born. Labour MP Steve McCabe is lobbying the government to standardise access to IVF. He has this stark warning. Unless the government has a complete change of direction at the moment, we're going to end up squeezing IVF out of the NHS altogether. We'll, it will become something that you cannot get treatment for in this country. A devastating prospect for Emma and hundreds of thousands like her. OK, let's speak to some of our studio audience now. And Aileen, I'm going to start with you. Now, you're from Fertility Network UK, and what you're asking for is equality. When it comes to the level of IVF treatment you're entitled to, that shouldn't be dependent on where you live in England. I mean, why is the system so unfair? 
Well, um, NICE guidelines are based on both clinical and health effectiveness. So, so they, they are, are designed to give the most, um, the best use of money and the most successful outcome. And yet what we're seeing is we're seeing CCGs, as your report um, in the opening said, adding these extra criteria, which are just so cruel and unfair. So your treatment is not based on your need, your medical need. It's based on where you live. And that's just not fair. Emma, we saw just really how desperate you are um, to have treatment, to, um, to have IVF treatment. Um, when it comes to how unfair you feel you're being treated, I mean, in, in, you're entitled to IVF treatment, but it's because your hormone levels are so high. And, and, and sadly, the, the clock is ticking. You're 39. I'm 39. As far as I'm concerned, we're babies. Um, but sadly, when it comes to the criteria needed to get the treatment you need, you can watch until 40. It's reduced in terms of the treatment you're entitled to. And at 42, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. How does that make you feel? Well, they've said that we, that we can have treatment um, now, but now um, my hormone levels back up again, but it's only 10 and it has to be 9 to go on the NHS. So mm. I don't see that my level is drastically high. And a lot of people say that the FSH hormone level doesn't really reflect what the NHS are saying anyway. So they're making up their own rules. That's how I feel. They're just making up their own rules as they go along and we're suffering for it. We're all suffering for it. I mean, Sarah, do you, feel, do you feel that way? Because you, you have a very similar story to, to Della. Your partner already has a child from a previous relationship, which immediately just cuts you off from any entitlement for IVF treatment. He does. And, uh, it, I mean, it, yeah, bottom line is it does feel quite unfair, but it's something that I can't personally get bogged down in too much because otherwise I'll go into a sort of downward spiral that I feel like a lot of people can get into. So the last few years I've sort of been working on myself, what I can do about it, which we can't really afford IVF at the moment, we're saving up for it. We've just got to think of the future. I can't dwell on it too much, as it were. How much are you saving up for? Well, we found something that is, um, there's unlimited IVF for two years and it starts at £12,000. <laughs> but it means that then you're not worrying about each individual cycle because that's something that will really st it stresses people out. It takes out. the pressure off. Oh, it takes the pressure off. And, you've got, yeah. and they say at the end you get your money back if you don't have a baby, which seems a bit weird. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it seems too good to be true, but it's something that we're looking into for next year, potentially, hopefully. That's something that we did, actually. We, did, we got the, a, a money back scheme if yeah. you don't have a baby at the end, which unfortunately we didn't. So the, the schemes out there that... Yeah. If you can yeah. raise the funds to get into it, then they are there. Well, how do you feel like they're, they're kind of selling a dream to you and they're trading off that because they know exactly how people feel and it almost, almost becomes a way of making money. Yeah. And what you're saying about the guidelines is really interesting because within, from my experience with the medical community itself, mm. they're disagreeing and they're arguing about what the guidelines should be anyway. Yeah. So you might go to one clinic and get one experience and go to another clinic and they'll say something else because they can't agree about the guidelines itself. Well, James, we're going to hear a lot more about you and, and your wife, Davina, in terms of the struggles you've been facing with um, fertility a little bit later. But we also want to hear from you tonight, whether you or someone you know has dealt with fertility problems, do make sure you try and join this conversation by getting in touch. Now, we are streaming live on Facebook right now to so leave a comment for us there. Just search for Five News or on Twitter. Send us your message with the hashtag fighting for fertility. Now, though, if you can't get IVF on the NHS and you can afford it, there are many couples that end up going down that private route. Just been hearing from some of them today. But as well as being very expensive, it's still far from guaranteed, even when it results in pregnancy. Nearly a quarter end in a miscarriage. Well, Hannah and Lewis Vaughan Jones have been trying for a baby for five years now. You may have seen their YouTube channel where they're documenting their IVF journey. We are going to start almost a year ago when they showed how quickly joy can turn into despair. <laughs> so congratulations. You're pregnant. <laughs> we just found out that the um, pregnancy hasn't progressed, that the... Um, the the fetus hadn't grown and the heartbeat wasn't there anymore. What was awful that was, that is the reason we're sitting here now and we're trying again because, you know, we are confident still that there is nothing fundamental that is wrong and so it gave us a lot of hope. 
you know, I suppose knowing that that I could be pregnant, even if it was only for however many weeks, is is you know a plus side because I think for a long time I just thought well, my body's just faulty, just this just isn't going to ever happen. Compression stockings are the black ones, and then just some other very fetching blue ones over the top. And the pink hat just finishes the whole look off. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's good. <laughs> Han's obviously been taking these injections over the last couple of weeks, which has been growing as many follicles as possible. Hello, Hannah. Welcome on stage. <laughs> and today is the big day where we go in and we get collect those essentially, and we see how many are uh, big enough and mature enough, and those ones that are, are then combined with the sperm, and then it's a, a weight to see how many of those still grow and get to kind of a, a proper embryo stage. These big black round objects are called follicles and usually they contain one egg each of them. I've never really met anyone, or not too many people who are kind of indifferent about their children. You know, most people would do anything for their children and we're exactly the same. We are desperate to have a family, so we just work really hard and put all our money uh, into this, and we make huge sacrifices outside of that because it's the most important thing for us. Well, Hannah, first of all, Lewis was right. You did look beautiful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> secondly, what happened next? Well, they collected nine uh, eggs from me in that theatre session, and. Uh, Unfortunately, only five of them were mature enough for uh, to be injected with sperm. And uh, then after five, six days, we only had two embryos that made it to that stage. Um, and then our plan all along was to send any embryos we had at what's called blastocyst stage off for genetic testing to see if there were any fundamental problems with it. And uh, sadly, about two weeks ago, we got the call from the clinic to say that, um, unfortunately, both embryos were, are not viable. So there's nothing to transfer. So we're back to square one back again. To square one. So, so what happens now? Because you've done seven rounds Eight. already. Eight rounds now. What happens next, Hannah? We're doing nine. <laughs> so we're going into it uh, in a couple of weeks' time, next month. So we, you know, we're, we're coming to the end of the, of mm. the line for us. Um, it's a very personal decision for each couple, each individual. Mm. Um, we, we, we feel that we're in the best possible hands now with the doctors who are caring for us and we feel there is still hope that we can get there because yeah. of the fact, as you saw in the film before, I did fall pregnant last year. Um, it did end in miscarriage, but there's, there's a huge yes. amount of hope to take from the fact that you can get pregnant. Um, I, so, yeah. No, so I was going to say, Lewis, you can see, you can see the emotion. Um, you spoke about the financial pressures as well. What kind of effect does that have on you two as, as a couple in your relationship? Uh, it's, it's hugely difficult to watch, I think for anyone, but to watch your you know, wife go through it. I mean, the, the drugs and the hormones is one thing, and then the emotional highs and then the awful lows and the struggles. And I have to you know, know that my wife is going through this. And each round that we start, I know that Hannah's, you know, we're putting ourselves through it all over again, and it's really difficult, it's really painful. I'm, I'm always going to crash at some point, so he knows he's got to, at some point, that month or those in the coming weeks, scoop me up off the floor again. Be ready for that. OK, Hannah, Lewis, good talking to you. We're going to keep talking to you. We're going to speak to you again um, later on um, in the programme. Um, but now, as we've heard, infertility can put immense strain on those going through it, physically, emotionally, and as we've heard, um, financially. For an exclusive survey, along with Fertility Network UK, we spoke to a 1,000 people about their struggles to have a baby. Well, 90% told us that infertility feels like a trauma. 55%, that's more than half, said it made them feel hopeless and like a failure. 
68% or two thirds said they believe other people think less of them because they don't have a child. While 94% said they don't think family, friends or even colleagues really understand what they're going through. And I know many of the people here will understand them how that feels. Um, Zoe, I'm going to come to you. Now, I know you've been struggling with weight loss, but when it came to having, having a child, you were ready. You lost weight. Gosh, you lost, what, five stone? I did, yeah. I lost the weight before going to see the mm. consultant because the big taboo around weight, I knew it was there. So I thought I'd just address that problem first. Mm. So um, then I was put on some lots of different medication which uh, caused rapid weight gain of four stone so now i'm back to not being at the weight needed mm. um so i'm not allowed ivf so do you do you relate to the 90 percent of people who told us that when it comes to yeah. fertility issues it feels like a trauma it is a trauma a lot of people assume when you originally find out you need ivf that's the trauma but the trauma continues because it's sort of highs and lows mm. all of the time um so for example my husband and i looked into doing it private but then we found out we would lose our two tries on the nhs just through going to do it private so there's around every cr a corner there's a problem basically mm. i mean kemi you're, you're an example of why the three free cycles on the nhs is so important you managed mm -hmm. to, to get pregnant on that third try you've got a baby boy he's going to be two next month yeah. is that right but w when it came to to talking to family and friends particularly coming from a west african and background nigerian would i yeah. be right in saying so when it came to talking to auntie and uncle they, they weren't really <laughs> forthcoming when it came to talking about the issues that you have no there's i mean the expectation is after getting a degree, getting a job, getting married, you're supposed to give birth. And if it doesn't happen within the reasonable time scales, reasonable, um, you find yourself having to explain const constantly why it's not happening. You know, people that you do know, people that you don't know. What's taking so long? I mean, you said you felt, you felt ashamed almost. I did. That's, just, that's shocking. You feel ashamed because... Ashamed for what? Almost for not being a woman, not living up to other people's expectations. My husband and I had, you know, we'd spoken about the fact that it would take us however long it would. But then when you're constantly explaining and people are saying things like, don't be so selfish, you know, get on with it. Why are, you, why are you taking so long? You feel less of a woman. You feel that, oh gosh, the whole world is looking at me. The whole world sees me as a failure. Mm -hmm. Everyone's talking about me. And that's just because no one in the community is talking about it. And there are hundreds of thousands of people who are going through exactly the same thing that I went through, but mm -hmm. are just too afraid to talk about it. Well, you're, you are trying to change it. You've got a blog talking exactly about IVF and issues and getting yeah. pregnant. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on um, in the programme. For now, though, we are going to take a quick break. Um, and we've also got um, to come on Five News tonight special. And we'll be hearing from the IVF pioneer, Professor Lord Winston, and why we're failing to diagnose the root causes of infertility. We'll see you after the break. Welcome back to our Five News Tonight special, Fertility Fighting for a Family. And we've been hearing some harrowing stories tonight of people who've been dealing with infertility. And we've also asked you to get in touch with your own experiences. And as we expected, lots of you have. First up, Maureen Christian on Facebook says, doctors should help people with fertility problems the same as any other medical problem. One is no more important than the other. Meanwhile, Tanya Squires says it took us 10 years to have a boy and he will be 16 in a few weeks time. I had five attempts of IVF, two I paid for myself and three were on the NHS. I think everyone should have the right for three attempts on the NHS. And Joe Ballam Curry says watching the show is bringing back so many memories from a five year journey. I'm grateful to have saved for private treatments and got rainbow twins after NHS failed, but not an option for so many. Thanks for sending us those comments. Please keep them coming through. We're going to try and maybe speak about it a little bit more on our Facebook Live. Um, but now we have been talking a lot about IVF and for many couples who struggle to conceive naturally, it can seem the obvious route. Well, and Professor Robert Winston is, of course, a pioneer of the treatment, but he strongly believes that too often IVF is presented as the next step without the cause of the fertility being properly investigated first. Well, he's been speaking to Tessa. He's worked in fertility medicine and research for 50 years and has seen IVF change thousands of lives. But Professor Robert Winston's take on the current situation is damning. 
He told me it's too often seen as the only option and prospective patients are being let down because they might have problems that are easier and cheaper to treat. With 50, 60, 70 different causes of infertility, there are so many different treatments that could be implemented so often and actually they're not being implemented. So we're losing skills in surgery on the fallopian tube, we're losing skills in hormone treatment. We've completely failed now with male treatments. We no longer look at the male anymore except just to inject the sperm into the egg. These are all second-class treatments in many ways and we should be being much more aware that there are all sorts of ways we could improve that by doing better research and also better medicine. As one of the, the very first people to be involved with IVF, how do you feel about the path that IVF has taken? Having seen how things were developing in the, in the 60s and the 70s, I feel anger about how it's turned out. I feel that we're not using the medicine scientifically properly. I think we are failing to use basic medical treatment properly, which you must involve establishing the diagnosis and treating the underlying cause of the infertility. But at the moment, what's happening, not only with the NHS, but also in the private sector too, is the fact that we're just using IVF as a casual for, for treatment, and it's not a very good treatment. It fails most of the time, and there are cheaper treatments which are better in a great number of cases. Hearing that, Professor Geaton, I think it's good to come to you um, here first. Um, do you agree? Is there, is there no such thing as um, undiagnosed infertility? Well, look, uh, it's sad that uh, Professor Winston feels this way. Uh, I don't broadly recognise that. Um, in the NHS, we have very clear pathways for diagnosis um, and treatment. And in fact, NICE guidelines are not just for IVF, they are for people with fertility problems, which include clear investigation pathways mm -hmm. and treatments in the treatment isn't always IVF. There are other treatments, as Professor Winston says, depending on the cause of infertility. And we, ha we do that. We do that, and we have to do that, because if we refer a couple or a woman for IVF, we have got to document all the investigations that we have performed and what treatments have been offered okay. and the justification for treatment. Okay, let me put that to Davina because you started your IVF journey and then after that you found out that actually you did have some um, infertility issues or fertility issues, yes, I should say. Definitely. I think we were given um, guidance by the gynaecologist we met in the NHS to just go straight to uh, IVF. There was no funding in our area at the time. So, at, you know, at the time, five, five years ago, we were very, very desperate. So mm. the first thing we thought was, yes, IVF was the way. And, and if I knew now, what, if I knew now what I would have known then, I wouldn't have jumped into IVF. I've learned so much about myself. I've learned so much about my health and my husband's health. And we've um, subsequently been diagnosed. I was uh, diagnosed with endometriosis, which I had a laparoscopy before in 2016 and I've had further um, acupuncture mm. which I've paid for myself and we have also had um, um, blood tests mm. we had further into the NHS by seeing another specialist who then told us that we have I have natural killer blood cells so I've been taking steroids for that if we had had those tests earlier on I probably would be a parent by now mm. so it is very sad mm. to have been pushed in the direction of IVF when it wasn't necessarily that straightforward and we didn't have to have it so soon into mm -hmm. us trying for a child. Mm, so. so interesting just seeing the differing views. I'm afraid yes. you are going to have to leave it there for now, but we'll yeah. try and come back to you in a moment, and Professor Gita, but thank you so much, Davina. Well, for many, um, IVF remains the best hope for having a baby. But as we've heard, it's not always available on the NHS and going private can also be too expensive. For some, it doesn't work at all, but others, there are other options available, even if they're not right for everyone. Here's Tessa. We've heard the cost of private fertility treatment leads some to credit cards, crowdfunding and even car boot sales. So why not a competition? The founders of an online fertility magazine heard so many stories from readers in financial jeopardy, they decided to pester private clinics for rounds of IVF to hand out. We managed to get 15 free IBFs uh, that we gave away in July and the response was just immense. So we thought, why stop there? So we are continuing to ask clinics for more free IVFs. 
More and more people struggling with infertility are looking abroad too, to Eastern Europe where IVF treatment is cheaper, to America where there's a greater supply of donor eggs and sperm for couples who can't use their own, donor embryos too. That's when couples who have had a successful round of IVF and given birth to their baby have produced some extra embryos during treatment. It's becoming popular to donate them, either to a fertility clinic to give to other couples or through adoption agencies, so they can even be involved in choosing the parents. When families learn that they have the opportunity to actually select the family for their remaining embryos, that's very attractive to them. And we have seen our program growing at about a 20% increase every year. But carrying a baby isn't an option for some women, like writer Sophie Berezina. Remission therapy after cancer in her early 30s means it's not safe for her to be pregnant. Chemotherapy left her infertile, so with donor eggs and her husband's sperm, they're trying surrogacy. Working with an agency in America who have found them a woman who they will pay to carry their baby. There's quite a strange feeling of jealousy because I feel like, I definitely feel like the third wheel in this process at the moment. Um, I'm not, and I know how important it is for me to be heavily involved and we need to form a great relationship with the surrogate and that's all, that's really cool and exciting and you know, you're developing a friendship. This is gonna be such an important person in our lives, but she's taking my place. But this obviously feels the right thing for you to do. Yeah, it absolutely feels the right thing because I can't imagine not having a family. It's still early days, but Sophie and her husband are feeling hopeful that they might finally be on the path to parenthood. Well, if you want to follow Sophie's journey, then check out her Mother Project official Instagram page and the column in the Times newspaper. Well, tonight we have heard some heartfelt stories from people and the struggles they face when it comes to having babies. And it's not an exact science and it's not an easy subject to talk about. It takes bravery to speak up like these women and men have tonight um, in our studio. We really hope these shared experiences can help anyone else going through something similar. And if you can take anything from tonight, it's that inf infertility needs to be much better understood by the medical world and indeed by all of us. We're going to be carrying on our conversation on Facebook. There's also plenty more on our own page, including advice and information about where to get help. Well, for now, thanks to our studio audience for sharing their experiences and their stories and for you at home and for watching and for sending your stories as well. You can see us live right now on Facebook. That's after the weather. Bye for now. Welcome back and thanks for joining us on Facebook for this and five news tonight special fertility fighting for a family. Well, we have been asking you to send us your messages, your comments, and you have been doing that. And first up, Hiana Pearson tweeted to say, I find it really unfair that weight limits are set just to have investigations. I completely understand that a healthy weight is needed to start treatment, but you should be entitled to the test to find a reason for infertility. Lizia Jew um, says adoption was and can be an option if treatment fails, but everyone has the right to try for themselves first. And Liz Riley says, feel sick watching the show. It's so unfair that society is making people feel ashamed for not delivering a family. It does feel like a trauma, a dark tunnel. You feel you'll never see the light at the end of, at, at the end of. Um, let me speak, let me bring forward actually one of the comments that was made um, who tweeted in to us um, saying that actually maybe adoption is an option. And reading from this survey and speaking to, to people such as yourself, those sort of comments are not helpful at all when you're going on this journey. I mean, when it, when it comes to, yeah. we, we, we highlight that in our survey as well, show of hands who, who've received unhelpful comments when, when going through this. <laughs> <laughs> Right, OK, so OK, let, let's start. Um, Sarah, what, what were the kind of comments that, that you've received and how well, does that make you feel? I think everyone can agree that the comment you get most is just relax and it'll happen. Mm, just relax. Because, yeah. you know, in the first two years, sure, I probably wasn't relaxed in the first two years. Mm. I was very beat up and very down about it. But then I've really worked hard the last two years with acupuncture and a bit of therapy and, you know, reflexology and things to become a really relaxed and positive person. But people still say it as if I'm sitting here like, oh, I need a baby now. <laughs> it's <laughs> fine. <laughs> I don't need the comments. And adoption is just such an obvious thing. You don't need to say that to somebody. It's yeah. obviously 
you yeah. know, it's just something for them to say because they feel awkward, basically. Yeah. I think it's, it's a really obvious thing. You can understand why people yeah. sort of say it first, but it's actually, it's a really complex process as yeah. well. And not everyone who starts the adoption process mm. gets to the end yeah. of it mm. with a child or with a family. So, you know, it's, it's a really um, ignorant thing to say as well, which, mm. and it's but just painful. It's and insensitive. Yeah. Yeah. It's, they don't mean to be insensitive. People don't mean to be, they just don't know. Yeah. And they're, they're trying to understand, and there's, there's so little awareness and understanding of the whole area and even with male fertility there's actually nothing mm. or hardly nothing i've sat in appointments with davina and all the attention is about davina yeah. and i ask a question i usually just ask a question to assert myself in the meeting so they know that i'm there mm. and yeah. hearing hearing dr robert winston say what he said was actually quite moving for me because i totally agree with davina i think it was it's very easy to say to, to us, given our emotional state, try IVF. And here I am at the stage where they're doing more investigation about me and it didn't have to be that way. Why wasn't it done a whole lot yeah, earlier? How, how does it feel um, as a man, and, and particularly when it comes to dealing with male fertility, um, how, how are you treated and, and what do you think might need to be changed, if anything? I didn't get to say it on live TV, which is a shame. But the, Don't worry, on Facebook, yeah. people are yeah. still seeing it, and you'll be surprised. Yeah. Gosh, it gets such a pick-up. Yeah, so yeah, go ahead, please, preach. It does. It's, it's, it makes me really angry because people don't know, and as it's very hard for men to even say anything, and they don't want to say anything. You can see the representation here, and the, it can be very difficult for men to articulate how they feel. Mm -hmm. Mostly it's rage, upset, frustration, and then a lot of the time I didn't, when we were looking at the third round of IVF or mm -hmm. possible IVF later, I didn't want to go through having to support Davina. A lot of the, a lot of the extra support is just that's what I'm here for, mm -hmm. not actually I'm dealing with my own fertility and I'm dealing with my own analysis of my semen and are they, is the sperm moving or not and whatever and it just doesn't get spoken about. I mean Lewis is this something you relate to? Yeah absolutely I mean you are the kind of you know bit part player and and you know lots of times that's you know kind of fair enough but you know we were bringing it up recently in our one of our most recent rounds and and the response from the doctor was well simply that that you know the sperm as a cell is so simple we don't really bother with it we don't take when we don't care about it um and so we focus all you know on, on the woman and so the oh, whole yeah, yeah. the whole industry is set up yeah. that way and yeah most of the time that's fine that's where it is but you know you i know. think you just took yeah. offense at the sperm being <laughs> <so Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> no i didn't take offense at that it's more that the the number of men or that when couples have fertility issues, mm -hmm. the number of times where, it, where it's a male factor is increasing. Yeah. Well, it's, but the most, it's the most HFEA figures are saying that male factor infertility is the biggest cause. Yeah. But yeah. the money doesn't play that way. And yet, yeah. man is the last, yeah. the the last person to, mm. be, to be looked into yep. in terms of there's any yeah. issues. The focus is on the woman instead. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I, but it is male factor. Yeah. Mm. Can I just say in the NHS, it's the woman who's the patient. Yes. Mm. And actually, it's about time we start recognizing both of them as patients. Yep. Yeah. It's always okay. the patient and it the It is partner. a patient and a partner, the patient mm. and the husband. So really the man just comes along with the woman and he hasn't got hospital notes, he hasn't got yeah. his own set. Everything about the man goes into woman's notes mm. and the man is not even recognised as a patient. So we have to start at that to start recognising the man as a patient as well and quite i mean really you know sad to hear your story there but i agree with you i think it's not there's a male infertility on the rise a significant amount of ivf now is done for male infertility and it is extremely important that we start talking to men we give them advice to improve their sperm and whatever possible to see if we can improve sperm rather than just going straight into IVF mm. um, or even counseling or services yes, as course. well because in a of lot course. of clinics private clinics yeah. especially I, I don't yeah. know about the NHS but you will be offered um, ca free counseling sessions mm. if you choose to take them up yeah. and I've done mm. that but there's never no one's ever approached you and said would you like to speak to a counsellor about what you're going through and it's yeah. quite interesting Kim I mean one of your your recent um, posts on your blog is talking about finding somebody else who's going through something similar and talking to that person if there isn't anybody else who, who, who is ready for you to talk to yeah. there are the people going through a similar um, situation similar thing that you can talk to yeah um, 
what I found is that, especially within social media, I know sometimes that can be frowned upon, but I found a huge family of people who are going through the same thing yeah. um, and just feeling unashamed to be mm. like, hey, this is what I'm going through, this is mm. it. And just being able, I mean, just speaking to everyone here today, I just feel that connection that you don't feel judged or anything and you just yes. feel like, I'm just going to tell you everything. I don't feel like you're going to go away and talk about me. <laughs> <laughs> let's, just, let's just cry together. And it's just, it's been, it's been absolutely amazing, the support system. the lift because yeah. before I come today, I don't really socialise with many of us, mm, you know? Yeah. So, like, mm. we've proper chatted and got yeah. to know each other and it has. It's it been helped? really, really nice, yeah. Okay. It's so, helped me a lot today because yeah. so, I'm not on my own and... Yeah. Obviously, I'm sat here on my own, but I've got a husband at home yeah. who is supportive. Mm. But just to speak to everybody else has been really refreshing. Just normalises yeah. it, yeah. I guess, as well. Mm. Yeah. Just makes you not feel so not normal. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. a real taboo subject, and people are really not comfortable yeah. about talking no. about it. As soon as, yeah. as soon as you start talking, you realise, you know, there's one in six people, three and a half yeah. million people, you know, you're definitely not alone. Yeah. Yeah. And it helps so much. Going, like, proper yeah. talking. <laughs> because you're so happy that you found somebody there to yeah. talk to. Understand. Yeah, yeah, who understands. Yeah. I mean, so you touched on it earlier. You, you're trying to put a positive spin. Mm. Um, you're trying to stay positive. But what sort of thing, what else do you do? Well, I just sort of try not to... I, I, the first two years, we, so we've been trying for about four and a half, five years now, and the first two years I was every month crying and then had a bit of a breakdown at the two-year mark thinking, oh, and then a, you, you have a wake-up moment where you think, well, this is just ridiculous and massive strain on my marriage, and I just thought, I've got to think of another way to be. So I started acupuncture and I started mm -hmm. talking to people and I started mindfulness which I, I don't know if anyone's ever tried yeah, that it's that, just a way of thinking it's just you think it's a situation you can't control so why are you dwelling on it just live your everyday life and it's something that is happening mm -hmm. but you have to live your life and be happy and mm -hmm. try and get through it and think about the future and think about other things that you can do to help yourself rather than think about what's going wrong you know I mean Zoe you've been put on medication which is yeah. which is supposed to help with the fertility but yeah. then is also caused with the weight gain so yeah. what happens moving forward then can you come off this medication yeah I know you've, you've lost you but you have lost weight you've been working really hard at a stone and yeah. a half I understand yeah um I am working really hard on it I am off it which is why I am back mm. to sort of trying to get to the goal weight but it is really hard to stay positive um I don't think there's enough support or I don't even think there's any support for mental health and yeah, the issues around it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm quite proactive and I've helped myself but not everybody feels confident to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so there'll be some people just completely lost, mm -hmm. not knowing where to access support. Even being pointed in the right direction sometimes helps. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's definitely not enough help. And that's even more dramatic for men. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it's even more of a blind spot. Everything you're saying is great and being, to, being able to talk to people who've been through it and then for men, there's nothing. Mm. And it get, it's, and it's even harder. And the knock-on effects on male mental health is huge as well. Mm. And I know of guys who, they put the woman's name on the appointment yep. because the hospital don't think that it's the guy yeah. who could have fertility issues. Mm. They don't treat it that way. So they always put their partner's or girlfriend's or wife's name on it. Yeah. I'm going to go back to, to our survey. One of the things that was identified is, is the jealousy aspect, seeing other people um, having children and when you yourselves are struggling. I mean, Hannah, that's something you've spoken about as well in, in your vlogs. Yeah, I mean, it, everyone will experience it at some point, that feeling of seeing um, a loved one or, quite frankly, a stranger <laughs> pregnant <laughs> um, <laughs> and male or female, whichever, you know, you, you still you look at that person and you're envious and you're green with envy. And the painful thing about it is not... You, of course, you wish them well. You wish Prince Harry and Meghan Markle well. <laughs> of course you do. But at the same time, a little bit of you kind of, like, mm. cries inside because... It's, you, just, you just desperately want that to be you. Mm -hmm. And then, on top of... So you have the envy to start off with and the jealousy, and then that suddenly turns to anger, not at the person, but you're angry with yourself because mm -hmm. it's a really unattractive um, characteristic and emotion to be feeling because you're basically unhappy about someone else's mm -hmm. happiness, and especially if it's someone you love, if it's a relative or a friend. That's just 
hugely painful. And so and then you beat yourself up. And then up. you beat yourself up about it. So you just go way. around in this cycle of just of kind of like being envious and being angry and then being cross and then you know it just goes round and round and round and round and round. How's it shown up for you, Lewis? As a man, I, I mean, I try and you know we have the famous conversation that when when that happens, I always say you know does it affect us? No. Does it mean anything at all? No. Does it ever so slightly increase our chances? Maybe yes. So it's a positive thing. But I, <laughs> but I, you know, I, the amount of times I've gone through saying that, you know, and, and I don't know how much impact it actually has. But yeah, no, well, you try and rationalise everything, which is great. I mean, so much of IVF is completely irrational because there's none of it makes any sense. <laughs> but I mean, you always try to come back to science and reason and rationality, which is something that, especially when you're on all the hormones and the drugs, you, oh, well, personally, I'm incapable <laughs> of those, those things. Rationality at yeah. all. Um, Emma, I was going to come to you because you've got so many friends with children. You have children all around you. Yeah. And just to, going back to talking about the sort of things people should be saying um, to anybody dealing with them, fertility issues, what, what can people be saying? Should people shy away from talking Nothing, about the issue? Nothing, really. You don't really have to say anything. Just treat us like a normal person. <laughs> you, you know, if you're pregnant, tell us you're pregnant. Mm. Yeah. The more you hide it and try and keep us away from the heartache of you being pregnant, the more it hurts us. Yeah, and invite Definitely. you, invite us to parties, kids' yeah. parties. <laughs> yeah, you know, people you go, oh, anyway, no. anyway. <laughs> oh, have a good kids' party. I was going to add to that. That isn't the only thing that's going on with people who want to have babies either. We've got so many other things yeah. going on in our lives. We've got work, we've got careers, we've got friendships, we've got family. Just because we want to have a baby does not mean that's the be all and end all conversation. You always have to start yeah. when you see us. Oh, hi, how are you? Oh, I'm really sorry it hasn't worked out yet. Ooh, that's not what we want to talk about. I want to understand what's going on with you, like how great life is for you. It's not always about us. He goes through the desperation, you know? but it doesn't have to define me as a man, whether I have children or not. It doesn't have to define Davina as a woman, whether she has, we have children or not. There's more to us than all of that. Yeah. Yeah. But um, Aileen, oh no, sorry, go on, Kerry, really quickly. Um, just. Kerry. Back on the back of what everyone was saying, I remember um, I have, I think, six godchildren. Yeah. And I remember... <laughs> <laughs> I remember um, at the christening of the most recent one, I just thought, did you just ask me because of the situation that my husband and I were in? And they said, no, we generally see you as a mother. We wouldn't have asked you otherwise. Mm -hmm. And that's when it really hit me that, OK, this thing is really serious, but other people see me as a mother. And then I started doing something called going out and buying clothes for my baby. I called it faith clothes. I just started <laughs> buying clothes yeah. and hanging it up in the wardrobe and saying, one day my child is going to wear this. And I remember when Samuel was born, he was, free, he was born at 33 weeks, so he was premature. And I bought the, the first size, the born baby size. And I remember the nurses saying, would you like us to give you some clothes? I said, no. Got <laughs> I bought this in faith. Got it covered. I don't care whether he's good. swimming in it, he's going to wear it. <laughs> well, Kemi and everyone, yeah. thank you so much. I'm afraid we are going to have to leave it there. Again, just thank you to everyone um, taking part here in the studio and you at home. Please keep sending and sharing your messages. It's so important, as everybody um, has said tonight. And um, talking so openly about such an important subject really, really does help. And to you at home for getting in touch and with your messages and your thoughts, thank you so much. There's so much more we would like to get into, but sadly, we just haven't got room from me and everybody here, though. Have yourself a very good night. Goodbye.